Hey, Stacy David here, and this is the Tales of a Gearhead podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Cornwell Tools, the choice of professionals since 1919. That's right, over 100 years building tools and still going strong. If you need tools, check them out. You won't be disappointed. All right, let's get rolling. All right, have you heard the big news that's been going around in the automotive world the last few days? And it's about the Corvette. And we just had some stuff come across the feed here. The president of GM has finally confirmed that there is going to be a hybrid Corvette and a full electric Corvette. There's all kinds of speculation that's going on. GM is holding some things pretty close to the chest, especially about the full electric. But we do have some things about the hybrid. First of all, they they dropped a video of it. They also released that it is an all-wheel drive, which is pretty cool. They have a clip of it launching, and you can see all four wheels digging. Now, they say that they're going to have the front wheels powered by an electric motor and the rear standard, which... Those of you guys that deal with four-wheel drives, you know the maddening amount of engineering that's going to have to go into that. Because anytime you're talking all-wheel drive, if those wheels are not spinning at the same speed, you've got a serious problem on pavement. Something's going to have to give. Things break or whatever. Just put mismatched tires on your Bronco, put it in four-wheel drive, and try to drive it down the street. You're going to have all kinds of handling issues. So to make those two things work together is going to be quite an engineering feat. Now, they're, they're really pushing on this thing. The hybrid system was originally planned to be a power adder. So they're going to put it on top of the top twin turbo version of the car. And the electric motor, like we said before, is supposedly driving the front wheels. And that would make it, you know, an all-wheel drive. Now, they're saying that the power should be somewhere around 1,000 horsepower. Although I think that is not going to be true because you know how Chevrolet is about the Corvette, especially the Z06, which is the top of the line. So I don't think they're going to build anything that's going to have more power than the Z06 unless this becomes the new Z06, which they're already pushing Corvette <laughs> Corvette enthusiasts a really hard bone here, man. I just I I don't know how well this is going to go over because... Corvette people are, you know, they're real car people. Just the C8 without a standard shift sent a lot of people into a, you know, a meltdown. So now they say that because the hybrid is essentially a plug and play module, they think that this could be added to the base C8 Corvette as well with the smaller engine. So you could actually maybe get the hybrid option on a lesser Corvette. Now, whether that's going to happen I doubt it because there's so much engineering that's going to have to go into making this thing work. I think you're going to have to choose, you know, the hybrid vet, the vet, or the all-electric. Now, when it comes to the (laughs) all-electric, the president of GM is sidestepping that question. Uh, Even about about when it's going to be available. He just says, you know, sometime down the road, yeah. Yeah, that's basically, we're going to see how much people jump on the hybrid first. The thing to remember here, with all of this stuff that's going on, you still have to remember that this is a consumer-driven market. And we are the consumers. So basically, they can put out whatever they want. But if we, as the consumers, don't want it, if we don't want a hybrid vet, if we don't want an electric vet, we don't buy it. And they don't sell them. And GM, in spite of all their stuff, is in it to make money. They're hedging their bets on this. Right now, electric is hot, and everybody's talking electric, so everybody's coming out with things. But if you've noticed, even the commercials that you see on TV talking about new electric vehicles, they're not available yet. You have to get on and order one. So they're trying to get people to commit before they even commit to building these things because they want to make sure there's a market. We're going to go into the whole electric question here on a on a podcast coming up where I'm actually going to go into a comparo between a, a gasoline powered or diesel powered vehicle versus an electric vehicle and try to give you a real rundown on how they truly compare. And it's going to be very eye-opening for a lot of people. But anyway, back to this. 
You know, I'm a technology guy. I, I like things, you know, when things come up, whether, you know, when nitrous first came out and superchargers and turbos and all that stuff, you know, if it's good, it's good. And I want to make sure that we're giving you guys the straight skinny on it. But if it's bad, I want to be honest with you guys as well. Um, there's not enough of that happening. So we want to make sure and do that. Now, the funny thing is, I'm going back to electric and hybrid vehicles now. The mistake that these guys are all making, it's like a bunch of rich guys got together that own these car companies, and they're all trying to build the faster electric supercar. You know, and, and, and Tesla started that, and now they're all trying to do that. And it's like, you know, if you really want to sell the American public on an electric-powered vehicle, build something affordable, build a Volkswagen Beetle-type vehicle that's ten grand that runs on electric power that a guy can run around town. If you do that, you might convince some people that electric is the way to go. But when you're building two or three hundred thousand dollar electric supercars that nobody can afford but that clientele, that does not sell the average person on electric at all. That's the biggest thing that I'm seeing out there. Nobody has gone in to just build a vehicle that is affordable and actually can compete with the gasoline and diesel-powered vehicles. And that's why people are fighting them like crazy. Uh, and I don't see that in the future. I don't see anybody coming out with that kind of vehicle. Nobody's talking about it. They're all trying to impress you with their speed. <laughs> I was having a, a conversation about this the other day. You know, they're all trying to build a car with over 1,000 horsepower and does 0 to 60 in 2 seconds. And, you know, most car people have never had the fastest car on the block. Every once in a while, you might, on one given night, be the fastest car in the neighborhood when the other faster cars don't show up. But that didn't stop us from being car people. You know, being having the fastest car or having something like that is not the reason that we're car people. And the guys that are putting out these electric cars seem to not realize that. So they're all like, well, you know, our electric cars are much faster than a, than a gasoline-powered car or something like that. And it's not just about being faster. There's other things at play here, and we'll cover that in other podcasts. But the automotive world is a passion-driven world. We do this because, first of all, we're not normal. We take a perfectly good vehicle and we modify it and make it cooler. And usually cooler means louder and faster and handle better and rumbly and, you know, looks crazy and all that kind of stuff that you just can't capture off of the showroom floor. The manufacturers have been trying to do that since the beginning of the automobile. And you cannot put out what people are going to want to do. People are too individual. In the 60s is the prime example where they started putting out muscle cars, you know, and they put, you know, Roadrunner on the side and they put Z28 and Stripes and all these things, and those were great cars. But the first thing that guys did is they would take a Z28 and they would put Krager mags on it and hooker headers and, you know, cherry bomb mufflers because that's what they wanted, you know. And the, and the OEMs, you know, they try to deliver all that, but we are individuals, so we want to individualize our vehicles. And you just you can't stop people from doing that. And so there's some real dynamics going on here. But anyway, for you Corvette people, I would be really, really eager to hear some of your takes on this. Um, I'll tell you mine. I would not drive a uh, electric or a hybrid Corvette. But I don't even want a C8 because I like to shift gears. I, I want something with a stick in it. So that's just my personal thing. It doesn't mean I don't like the, the, the C8 Corvette. I think it's great. And I really like the mid-engine uh, design. I've messed with a lot of mid-engine cars. So I like that. <laughs> so I would be really eager to hear your take on it. You know, one question I get a lot uh, when guys are talking about jobs is about Cornwell Tools. We talk about Cornwell a lot. And you see me use their stuff on the show a lot. People are asking, hey, how do I become a dealer? Man, all you have to do is contact Cornwell. Tell them you're interested in becoming a dealer and uh, you'll be on your way. And it is a great company to work for. And they've been around a long time. You've seen the tools. You've seen the way they operate. 
they're definitely worth checking out. So if you're sitting there and kind of wondering where your life is going to go and maybe looking for a new career, you may want to look into becoming a Cornwell tool dealer. Okay, this next question is very interesting. This comes from Gary. And Gary says, have you ever utilized an Envoy to build a late model 50s truck? He said, I'm going to attempt a cowl and floor splice and would like a few ideas or what to watch out for. Very specific question. And ironically, we are covering that kind of stuff on a project that we're doing on the show right now where I'm building these motorized toolboxes. And it's basically showing how to splice two vehicles together. And the concept is the same, whether it's a lawnmower and a, and a toolbox or an Envoy and an early 50s truck. The, the concept and the setup is the same, just on a little different scale. Now, to answer your question, no, I haven't done it with an Envoy, but I've spliced a lot of vehicles together. And it can be a really good way to go. If you've never done this before, and I assume you haven't, but obviously you've got some fabricating skills or you wouldn't even be asking this question. You know, to even be considering a, a body and frame splice like this is pretty in-depth. So I assume, you know, you're going to know what I'm talking about here. But the biggest thing that you want to do is take measurements. I mean, I'm talking wheelbase. I'm talking width. You know, you're talking about splicing the floor and the cowl. You're going to have to know where to splice those. You're going to have to know the widths. And you need to kind of pick a vehicle that's going to work. You know, it might be an Envoy, but there might be another vehicle that actually fits better. And you may look at it and go, you know, I just want to swap frames. And, you know, a really popular frame swap is the S10. Uh, and, you know, then you kind of build your own cowl. That's kind of what we did on Sergeant Rock. There was a, a cowl that had been spliced in there, and it was, it was not salvageable. For me, it was easier for me just to cut it out and fabricate a whole new cowl and a whole new firewall than to try to splice something together. I would have spent way more time, and it wouldn't have looked as good. That's really important to kind of keep that in mind. Also, your drivetrain, you know, the width of the fenders, there's, there's so many other things that you really need to sit and look at and go, okay, this is what I want to use from this vehicle. This is what I don't want to use. Now, a lot of people that are listening to this might be going, well, why would you even do that? That just sounds like a lot of planning and a nightmare. Well, the reason is because you can pick up a used or wrecked vehicle for almost nothing. And that means you're literally getting a ton of high dollar parts for almost nothing. It's a really good deal if you know how to splice these things together. And if you can utilize something off of a donor vehicle, not only does it save you money there, but then if you ever need to replace it, you can go down and go, hey, this is a master cylinder off of an Envoy. And you can get it right across the shelf at AutoZone or whatever, as opposed to some, you know, exotic thing or something that you had to buy from, you know, Willwood or Bear or somebody like that. So it can be a real money saver for you. You think that I hammer on people about the project planning book on regular projects. A splice deal like this? Oh, man, you have got to keep accurate records. And when I say accurate records, a lot of times... Guys will come in and go, okay, I'm going to use these parts, this, and this, and they'll write that in their book. And then a few months down the road, they go, you know, that's not working. I'm going to change it. And they go to something else, and they forget to change it in their book. And then as time goes by, they're like, okay, now what did I use here, and what did I do? And it can become a real nightmare. Or especially if you try to sell the vehicle, that gets into that whole thing we've talked about that if... You know, somebody wants to say Gary gets halfway through this project and he's like, I'm done with this thing. And he sells it. And if you're a guy coming in, man, you're like, what has happened? Gary, this, uh, this will help you first in getting it done. And it will also help you in selling it and moving it if you ever want to do that. Yeah, I would strongly suggest if you've got the skill to do it, I would strongly suggest looking into a, a splice like that or joining the two vehicles together. Just be aware you know, what you're going to be doing and what it's going to take to do it and take a ton of measurements. And uh, send some pictures, man. I'm eager to see what you're coming up with. It sounds really cool. All right, here's another bit of news 
We see that the Biden administration has uh, plans to allow dirty E15 gas to be used year-round. Now, I know some of you guys couldn't get past the fact that I mentioned Biden. This is not a political thing. I'm talking about gasoline here. By the way, how are you enjoying those gas prices out there? Yeah, kind of putting your summer in a bind, right? Well, this is what they're trying to do to lower the price. All right, most of you guys are familiar with E10 gasoline, ethanol, that is added to gasoline. Well, basically what they're doing is they're trying to put E15. Now, basically, for those of you that don't know, that's 15% ethanol added to gasoline for various reasons that we're going to go into here. Now, ethanol, just so you know, is basically made out of corn. So just like I was having a discussion with Gail Banks a couple years ago, we're basically taking food and putting it in our gas tank. So when next time you see food prices going up, you can remember what we're talking about here as well. That's one thing to be thinking of. Now, why would you do that? Why would you add ethanol to gasoline? Well, with this, it makes it cheaper because it's cheaper to do the corn aspect, but the ethanol has only a third of the energy of gasoline. So you're going to get less power out of the same gallon of gas, which means ultimately that lowers your fuel mileage. And then E15, the reason E15 is not available all year around is it puts out more pollution. Now, did you hear me correctly there? It puts out more pollution. Well, the whole point here was for the environment, correct? So, while the price of gasoline might be going down 10 cents per gallon because of this, you're adding more pollution to the air in the summertime, which it's usually prohibited for 15% ethanol to be put out during the summer because of this, and you get less power and mileage out of your engine for the same gasoline. So are you really saving that 10 cents per gallon? Yeah, now just, just dance that one around in a circle. All right, that wraps it up for us today. Make sure that you check out the uh, Gears TV website. We've got all kinds of cool stuff there. We've got a couple new die casts coming out. Got some books coming out. Uh, we have all kinds of things going on. But the most important thing is get out there and turn some wrenches yourself. Get a project. If you don't have one, start working on it. And if you don't have tools, check out Cornwell. They can help you out there. 